After years of anger and bitterness brought on by the IndyCar split, a reprieve would finally come in 2008. After 12 years, IndyCar would finally be reunited. However, after this came about between the 2007 and 2008 IndyCar seasons, there would be some strange races to come out of this. One of these races wouldn't even count towards the 2008 season. For the first time since a Marlboro Challenge held back in 1992, there would be a non-championship IndyCar race, this being the 2008 race held at Surfer's Paradise. It was certainly gonna be an interesting event, like the 17 previous races held on the track. However, this one has always been the most intriguing to me. I never got to see this race live, considering I was about 3 years old at the time, and won't even watch my first IndyCar race for another 3 years. But despite that fact, this race has always stuck out in my mind. We had different names in different places, and returning champions having one last hurrah before the year was out. So in similar fashion, today, in my last upload of 2022, let's take a look back on the 2008 Nikon Indy 300 at Surfer's Paradise. This race would end up being an early glimpse into what the 2009 season would look like. Dario Franchitti would return to the series after a disappointing year in NASCAR, driving what would end up being the iconic number 10 for Chip Ganassi. As for the previous driver of that car, Dan Weldon, he would sign for Panther Racing, taking Vitor Mira's seat who would drive for AJ Foyt. This would leave Britt Darren Manning without a seat. Will Power drove for KV Racing, which had absorbed the remains of Team Australia after the reunification. Power was set to make his final start for the team he started his career with, as in early 2009, he would join Team Penske. Speaking of Will, he would start from the pole in Surfer's Paradise for the third year in a row. Although he was a fast qualifier on the streets, he had not gone to Victory Lane there before. In fact, entering this race, no else he had gone to Victory Lane at home. Getting back to the starting grid, Will Power is on pole as I said, and joining him on the front row would be your 2008 Indy 500 winner and 2008 IndyCar Series champ Scott Dixon. The first two groups of qualifying were affected heavily by rain, seeing Danica Patrick and AJ Foyt both bring out yellows for incidents, disallowing their times and putting them on the back row of the grid. Townsend Bell would be the slowest qualifier, with his time in the first group being 24 seconds slower than Will Power's pole time. With the storylines from qualifying out of the way, we can get to the start of the race. Will Power would get a great start, jumping ahead of Scott Dixon. Ryan Briscoe in third also got a good start, going side by side with Scott into turn one. Dixon would bail out of the turn, taking to the runoff area. Alex Tagliani would do the same. Just one turn later, and we would have our first incident of the day. Rookie Mario Marias and Vitor Miro would go side by side, with the two making contact. Marias would spin, but not get collected by any oncoming cars, while Miro would keep it straight before pulling into the pits to fix his damage. Besides that, some corner cuts here and there, lap 1 was surprisingly clean, with Will Power pulling a big lead. This lead would grow even more before 2nd and 3rd place would hit turn 1. It was ruled Scott Dixon left the track and gained an advantage, with him subsequently being told to give up his position to Briscoe, extending Power's gap even more. Power was dominant early on in this race, however Briscoe was slightly gaining. He had cut a second off the gap between the two, before the first caution of the race would come out. It was yet again Mario Marias, this time all by himself. He was running towards the back when he would clip the wall, break his left side suspension, and then spin across the track. It was a rough end to an equally rough rookie season, which saw him only get three top tens. There were also issues for Townsend Bell, but the cameras never caught what happened. After a brief caution, we would get the race restarted, with Power holding the lead still. However, there would be issues in the back. Things would go from bad to worse for Danica Patrick, who after making it up to only 15th, would make contact with Elio Castroneves, after the latter pulled a frankly overambitious move on Danica. Elio would pick up a puncture, as Danica broke her front wing. Besides that, however, the restart was clean for the most part. This was until lap 17. Will Power was still in the lead, but Briscoe was closing in yet again. The lead was down to 1.3 seconds when Will Power entered the Turn 5-6 chicane. He would hit the inside wall of Turn 5, break his left front before hitting the outside wall of 6. He couldn't even bring the car back to the pits, pulling into the escape road of Turn 8. The man who would eventually break the record for the most poles ever in IndyCar had a pretty bad relationship with pole position back then. In fact, before 2009, he had never finished in the top 10 from the pole. With power out of the race, Ryan Briscoe would of course take the lead, holding it for three laps before the pit stops began. Briscoe was the first to come in, relinquishing the lead to Dixon before he too came into the pits right as the yellow came out. Graham Rahal tried to go down the inside of Ed Carpenter into turn 9, with the two making contact and blocking the track. 
AJ Foyt IV, making his last ever start for Vision Racing in what would end up being his last ever full-time season, would check up and stall. Danica Patrick would then arrive on the scene, as safety crews were trying to get the others restarted. They point her to go down the inside, while the safety crews were still trying to roll back AJ Foyt. She would stop her car, considering she had nowhere to go, then, as she had a clear track ahead of her, she tried to get going, and then stalled it. While all of this was going on, Dario Franchitti took the lead for two laps before pitting himself and giving the lead back to Ryan Briscoe. The ensuing restart was clean, briefly, as just five laps later, Franchitti would spin and stall in turn six, bringing out the third and final caution of the race. By the halfway mark, the race was still under yellow, with Ryan Briscoe in the lead, Scott Dixon in second, Alex Tagliani in third, Ryan hunter in fourth, and Tony Kanan rounding out the top five. During the next commercial break, more specifically lap 34, Tony Kanan's day would come to an abrupt end, after his right rear suspension broke. This was certainly a shame for Tony, but a blessing for EJ Vizo, who would be elevated up into the top 5 as a result. The next pit cycle would be fairly clean, as after Vizo and Tagliani led laps at one apiece, the race would fall back into the hands of Ryan Briscoe. After 60 laps on the day, Ryan Briscoe would score the race victory, with Scott Dixon shortly behind, and Ryan hunter Ray about 10 seconds back of the both of them. Briscoe would become the first and only Aussie to win the race, in what would end up being the final Gold Coast Indy 300. The race organizers struck a deal with the A1GP series to host a race in 2009, but after that series collapsed, it became a staple of the V8 supercar schedule, a race still being held annually. As for this race itself, it really wasn't that good. It certainly had its moments, but for a non-championship race, I was expecting something more. But then again, that's a double-edged sword effect you get with non-championship races. You want to win because you have nothing to lose, but that also runs a risk of wrecking a car when you have nothing to gain either. I question the wisdom of running a non-championship race on a street course, and this race certainly wasn't helped by the fact that it was held in possibly the least competitive era of IndyCar history. So although there were some interesting stories to come out of the race, it just wasn't that exciting of an event after watching it. To round this video off, I just want to thank all of you for the incredible support you've shown me in the past year. We started 2022 with just over 150 subscribers, and we're on track to start 2023 with over 600. Through the 95 videos posted on this channel, and nearly 6 hours of content in total, this year was awesome for me, and I hope it was awesome for you as well. For 2023, I've got a lot in store for y'all, and some pretty big projects I've been working on for a while now. So whether you've been here since day one, or this is a first video of mine that you've ever watched, I hope you can join me for the year ahead. Thank you all so much for watching, and have a very happy new year.